All right, welcome back to Beagle Live Visions. I do apologize if you can hear Squirt Dog. Uh, Squirt Dog is right behind me, over my shoulder, eating food. He's just going to town at uh, 9 30 p.m. at night. Um, but that's okay. We love Squirt Dog. He can eat all the food he wants. I hope you guys don't hear it. And if you do, like I said, I'll, I apologize. We're gonna wrap up episode number eight here of the number eight of the Cubbyhole podcast. So let's jump into it. Let's go. Uh, this is a hard thing to explain. I've been trying to figure out a way to make a model for this, but uh, the main thing to understand is there's seven circumpolar stars that go in succession, and that the chronology would be based on which star was venerated first, and then when it completes. It's the, the 26,000 year cycle, then that original star would come back into primacy. So it, that's a difficult subject, you know, and I, I'm not really fully prepared to, to open up that full subject, but it's a seven. And the significance of that seven is venerated into Ursa Minor and then ultimately venerated into the, the building of the pyramids. So in regard to uh, going into the greater mysteries is relative also to keeping or to trying to put a finer point on time. And it's in regard to agriculture. Because, you know, the, the idea of the Sabbath is about when to plant, when to harvest. So every seven years we rotate crops or do not plant. So that's what the Sabbath is, is really about. It's, it's about agriculture. These are not only heady topics, they're very involved. So just to, to give a mention of them is almost a disservice without fully opening up the, the eight-hour presentation for each individual topic that we're, they're we're trying to discuss here. But see, I understand your question, you know, um, and I'm going to try to figure out a way to, to answer that as quickly as possible. So, you know, the idea of a month is a moon. It comes from a lunar cycle. And a lunar cycle is, a typ is typically associated with uh, 14 days of a waning. Um, let me say that again. Uh, 14 days of a waxing angle of the moon and then 14 days of the waning angle of the moon. And that corresponds to the, f the female menstrual cycle. So menstrual is moonstrual. A month is a moonth. And it represents 14 days of waxing lunar angles and then 14 days of waning lunar angles. So it's a 28 day cycle. And in the fact that it's a seven, we can understand that because the lunar mythos is succeeding the stellar mythos, how they're bringing the seven on into the lunar phase. That's very important to understand. When we get into the solar phase, we're dealing with the nine and then ultimately the 10 and, and then 12. So it gets, a little bit confusing, um, actually very confusing, because ultimately we're going to have to be mature enough to admit that this has befuddled mankind for tens of thousands of years. And to hear me tell it, it's been befuddling mankind since we first transferred from the stellar phase into the lunar phase, which is about putting a finer point on time. So they wanted to venerate in the annual cycles because they wanted to put a finer point on time. Ultimately, we developed these calendars, and these calendars were, were based on annual cycles. In the stellar phase of the mythology, it's not that they didn't recognize the annual cycles, but they did not venerate their mythology into the annual cycles because they understood, quite frankly, the danger of it. Part of the danger of it was losing their chronology because by venerating in long epoch cycles regarding the great year cycle, they were able to keep track of long periods of time. So they understood there was danger in venerating and moving their mythos into the annual cycle. So they actually were more, they, they were more attentive to their annual cycles based on what we call the inundation. And the inundation is the annual event where the Nile floods its banks and refertilizes the Nile Valley. Because this is all happening in the Nile Valley, which is 4,000 miles long in Northern Africa. So when I say Egypt, you know, I'm typically referring to this 4,000 mile valley of the Nile River, which flows north and empties into the Mediterranean Sea at the Delta. Modern Egypt is the northernmost part of that river right before the Delta. 
But uh, when I say Egypt, I'm basically referring to the entire 4,000 mile stretch of the Nile River flowing north through northern Africa. So without getting too far off track, this is difficult stuff. You know, it's, it, it's hitting me hard because I really want to help us understand this, but I realize how exhausting it is just thinking about how we can get this out on the table and start to discuss it because these are these are big topics and i'm going to try to wrap this here well i I wanted to uh just say that yeah like everything you're saying is leading up to the the question that i was um asking which was basically just there's no coincidence that you know september is sept day uh which is you know september is nine um, that's a ninth month, but it's sept day, which is seven. And then you have October, which is the 10th month, but it's actually octo, which is eight. And then you have, uh, uh, November, uh, which is the 11th month. It's actually the ninth month, which is, uh, Nove. And then you have Deca, which is, um, 10 for December. And December is the 12th month. So I just find that really interesting that the the information is stored in those names as the you know the the eight nine ten or uh seven eight nine ten right it reveals to us that the calendar has been augmented and then if we look at the whole calendar its entirety and we have the month of july which we can associate with julius and then august which we can associate with augustus we see that there's a Roman convention in this calendar. And it is known, the early calendar at that point was was known as the Julian calendar, which was replaced in 1582 by the Gregorian calendar. And that also corresponded with what was known as the, or what we know as the error in time when basically all indigenous peoples were forced onto the mechanical clock. And that typifies a shift in the world population going into materialism over spiritual purpose. So that's what this error in time is actually referring to, is a, a shift of world population into materialism by being forcing indigenous peoples onto the mechanical clock and replacing the Julian calendar with the Gregorian calendar, introduced by Gregory the 13th, Pope Gregory the 13th. So... We're getting way ahead of ourselves, but I think we're making this point. Main thing is, I'm trying to say, is that part of the corruption of the mythos itself is an effort by mankind to put a finer point on time. Because that's what led us into the greater mysteries. And the ambition for utility and ultimately convenience and technology, which is where, you know, what the greater mysteries have unlocked, we've left the lesser mysteries which are our foundations our, our our fundamentals our principles disregarded and ultimately lost in the sands of the sahara so we have to understand that having the greater mysteries and the ability to wield elemental powers in the modern world without the responsibility of the temperance that's provided by the lesser mysteries is like a kid who's found his dad's loaded gun an irresponsible spoiled little brat who's found his dad's loaded gun so these lesser mysteries, quite frankly, are really the only way we're going to get out of this. It's all about what we care about. You know, we have to understand that the value systems that we have now are corrupted because they're based in materialism, which gave us corrupted ideals like selfishness, moral relativism, social Darwinism, and ultimately eugenics. So virtue has been replaced you know virtue has become that which leads to a stronger state and that gives rise to you know i'm going to use the term socialism but when i say socialism i mean all all forms of coercive control centralized control of resources not socialism in the political sense that most people think socialism is the ambition to control and control is an action based in fear any action based in fear results in chaos. So our knowledge and our, our ability to reason ultimately has to be based on a value system where we are aspiring to harmonize with nature rather than to dominate and control nature.
So the nature of the corruption in the modern world is based on, you know, the fear of death. Because the idea that we are nothing more than our physical body and death is a final dissolution. Well, from the standpoint of the ego, which wants to remain executor of the body or the being, that's true. Because when the body dies, that's the death of the ego. And that's the last thing the ego wants. So the ego is going to do everything it can do to remain executor of the being and that's what roots us in materialism is the belief that we that all we are is the physical body so we're using the body to serve the body instead of using the body to serve the life force in the body which is an everlasting force like i say these are heady topics but to not go too far off that point yeah you make a good point that is revealed in the nomenclature of our calendar that sept is seven, oct is eight, nov is nine, and deca is 10. So obviously the last four months of the calendar are seven, eight, nine, ten, but we are familiar with them as nine, 10, 11, 12. It's no irony that we can see that the month of July and the month of August correspond to Julius and Augustus. So we know we're dealing with a Roman convention and we know the calendar that preceded the Gregorian calendar was the Julian calendar, which obviously is making an inference to Julius Caesar. So we know it was a Roman calendar and then ultimately replaced by the modern Gregorian calendar. Before I wrap that, I just want to say that, you know, I, I want to repeat that all things 12 are dealing with the Zodiac and the 12 t signifies the greater mysteries. So we know there's astronomy involved. I don't want to, I don't want people to confuse the word astrology. I mean, we have to be able to make a distinction between all of these things regarding how the stars have been used. Understand that man's endeavor to put a finer point on time has what's led us great into the greater mysteries, but also partly responsible for how the mysteries themselves have been co compromised and corrupted and how physical ambition took precedence over spiritual purpose. These are all very heady topics, you know, but it's a very important question and it really, it really needs to be understood. There's not enough I can say about it in the context of a standard podcasting format, but see the idea is that we're laying the foundations now and we're going to come back and try to continue to build on these foundations and make this as accessible to laity as possible. You know, I want to say I want to make it accessible to, to colleagues as well as laity. But the fact of the matter is, there's very few, if any, who have devoted such time as is necessary in scientific research to fully understand the significance and the depths of what the mysteries are about. It's a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing to understand. But the significance of the mystery schools is to give us access to the tools by which we can access the sublime information so and what's ha actually happened in the physical sense is that we're we're reactivating or activating an atrophied area of the brain until those areas of the brain are activated we don't have the perception to perceive the sublime information so what is right in front of us is elusive to us or not accessible to us because we don't have the areas of the brain that activated that are necessary to be able to decode that information. So that's that's really part of the dilemma of archaeology and anthropology is that we, we have a case where we're going to the information without enough knowledge. We have to bring the knowledge to the information, which means we have to be bringing a fully developed, activated brain to the information or the same thing that is eluding our colleagues or our contemporaries is eluding us. Well, um, <laughs> this has been a really, really powerful show. And I'm, you know, I'm just blown away that we have a place to bring this type of knowledge and lay a foundation for what's to come. Because, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're hearing on this show, if you're not familiar with a lot of these words, it takes a lot of prerequisite to really understand or to begin to even understand what you're hearing here today. 
and we're definitely going to continue this and put a finer point on all these topics as much as we can to have a better understanding because uh, this information is really important. And uh, if you want to, you can let people know why, you know, in, in short, why this is so important and what you'd like people to know and where they can find this type of information. Even though you've already stated that, if you want to go ahead and let people know that, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up. Right. It, it is the premise of the show. The premise of the name of the show is The Cubby Hole. And there's just a few other things that I wanted to make sure and mention regarding the cubby hole. Um, Circle Dot is very, very significant. It's one of the most ancient and one of the most sacred symbols. So when we consider Circle Dot, we should think of the, of the dot as the center as the same as the center point of the gavel. It's where the action takes place. That's Horus. That's where the masculine penetrates the physical world. But Circle Dot is archetypally a bird's eye view of a spire or a cone. So it's a two dimensional bird's eye view of a three dimensional cone. And the cone is the spire. So it's no irony that religious buildings typically feature a spire. And this word spire infers from Latin spirare the breath and the breath is significant because it represents the life force in the physical body Crazy and the idea here, of yeah. um, well the idea is that the, the breath is the life force you know and if there's no breath there's no life so uh this spire is very significant and relevant to circle dot because uh the word spiritual is the ritual of the spire so spiritual is the spire ritual and that is the veneration of the circle dot which represents cone which is venerated in the evergreen which represents eternal life so the archetypal christmas tree is the spire it's a spire ritual spiritual i wanted to make sure and mention that because these topics are going to keep coming up when I come back on the show, I mean, we're going to get right back down to this same material here and work on these foundations because it's only by understanding what came before can we understand what came after. And that means the evolution of human mental processes, how culture progresses. We have to understand it in its earliest forms to, to understand what it becomes in its later forms. And this seems to be one of the general dilemmas of archaeology, geology, and anthropology. So we're going to keep focusing on that. And in regard to the cubbyhole, um, in the name is preserved the concept of the little bear, which we've touched on, Ursa Minor, and the circumpolar constellations and the circumpolar pole stars in a group of seven. And we've touched on the significance of the seven in regard to the lesser mysteries and we've touched on the significance of the 12 in the greater mysteries which we get by adding the five to the seven so we've touched on the significance of the numerology but we've only just opened up these subjects so i want to invite everybody to come back as we continue to unfold these concepts and understand that these are the foundations of the evolution of the human mental process and I brought along just a list of things that I feel are the criteria for us to really be able to understand not only the self, but the solutions to the human dilemma. Get your notepads ready. So I want you to be able to take these questions and flesh out these questions. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So we have to, you know, I already stated that the task of the hero was to be able to demonstrate the lesser mysteries. So now that we've taken on the greater mysteries, now the task of the hero is not only to be able to demonstrate the lesser mysteries, but also demonstrate the greater mysteries. But in pure forms, the task of the hero, Horus, let's say, was to be able to demonstrate an understanding of the lesser mysteries. So to be fully raised or what we might call enlightened meant the criteria for that was to be able to demonstrate an understanding of the lesser mysteries. Now that we've taken on the greater mysteries, that criteria is not only to be able to demonstrate 
the lesser mysteries, but also to demonstrate the greater mysteries, because we've taken on that responsibility. So we have an obligation to do so, or we are that spoiled brat, you know, running around. With dad's loaded gun. With dad's loaded gun. These are the questions, and the answers to these questions are the criteria. And this, this needs to become common knowledge, which means understood by the majority of the masses. All of the answers to these questions and the extrapolating on the questions and the criteria, or, or the answers to the extrapolated questions are the criteria for us being able to be mature enough to, to handle the forces which we've unlocked. Okay, let me just put it that way. So... What is mythology? What is the purpose of mythology, for instance? See, expand, extrapolate on these questions, which we already answered at the beginning of the show. I gave you the Gerald Massey take on mythology. There's your answer to what is mythology. Well, mythology was the expression of the early science. So the direct answer to what is mythology could be acceptable in saying, Mythology is the depository for man's most ancient science. You know, there's the one sentence answer to what mythology is, but it also constitutes an ancient expression. What is theology? What is dogma? What is religion? We have to understand how words become ambiguous. So we have to be able to think dialectically. Yeah. We have to be able to look at it from both sides. We have yeah. to be able to see the negative space. What is the cradle of human civilization? See, this is criteria that I feel is fundamental and not only has to be understood, has to become common knowledge. What is totemic sociology, which we've touched on and tried to help us understand today? What is symbolism? You know, how would we extrapolate on that question? What is, what is the significance of symbolism? It's a primitive expression, but ironically, turns out to be our higher potential for expression. What does dogma, or where does dogma come from? Gerald Massey also gave us the answer to that. He said it was the mistaking of the mythology for history, the mistaking of the mythology for history, or divine revelation gave rise to dogma. So the misinterpretation of mythology and then the mistaking of the mythology for history and divine revelation gave rise to dogma. You know, so I'm just trying to give you an understanding of how to extrapolate on the question and how to look for the answer and how to discover the answer. And we talked about truth discovery methods. What is science? What is epistemology? What is the difference between a solar temple and a stellar temple? Understand that all new religions endeavor to do, obliterate all traces of their predecessors. So they're building their temples on, this, on the hollowed ground of the previous phase of the mythos. So the solar cult or the solar people are building their temples on the hallowed ground of the stellar temples. That's why Rome is built on the city of seven hills, or it's the city of seven hills, because it was originally a stellar, or it was originally stellar hallowed ground, and they were mound builders. So they built their temples on the sacred seven mounds, which typified the little bear, which typified what the pyramid is. What does primacy in the north refer to? Very advanced. Why were the pyramids built? What is a secret society? What is a caravan? Who were the Druids? What is significant about the Druids? What is the Fisher King legend? What is the legend of Osiris? What is the mythos? What is the evolution of the mythos? What is spirituality? What is circle dot? What is the Sphinx and why was it built? What is Sinocephaly or Sinocephalus? Dog-headed. What's the significance of that? What is the difference between magic and fetishism? What is the hero cult or what is a hero cult? What is this? Okay, now pay attention here. What is astronomy? What is urinography? What is astrology? What is astrotheology? What is cosmology? What is cosmography? So we need to be able to make the distinction between all of those things with regard 
to early astronomy? You know, I'd like to give you, just go ahead and give you the answers, but uh, we'll just save that for the next show. See what you can do on your own and flesh out that and make the distinction between those terms. What is culture? What is agriculture? What is evolution? What is history? What is natural law? What is hermeticism? What is Neoplatonism? What is cuneiform? What is Minoan civilization? Who were the Mycenaeans? What are the Elohim? What is eschatology? What are the mysteries? What are the mystery schools? What are the lesser mysteries? What are the greater mysteries? What is gematria? What is the occult? What is socialism? Think hard on that one. What is heraldry? <laughs> Little green language there. Her all dry. Infertility. What is chivalry? What is valor? What is arete? What is veritas? What is geography? What is geometry? What is sacred geometry? Why sacred geometry? Basic archetypal forms, foundational archetypes. What is the trivium? What is the quadrivium? What are the liberal arts? And here's a good one. <laughs> here's a good one. What is conservatism? I'd like to see how many voters can answer that properly. What is liberalism? Ditto. What is, you know, so... <laughs> I'll save it for the next show. But anybody that can't answer those questions that participates in the political system should be ashamed of themselves. Ooh. What is a so cromlech? What is, what is a tumulus? What are tumuli? How old are the pyramids? Who built the pyramids? Why were the pyramids built? How were the pyramids built? What is language? What is philology? What is ethnology? What is etymology? What are the Sabbaths? What is the Sabbath? What is the little bear? What is the minora? Ursa minora. Minor mysteries. Lesser mysteries. I gave that away because I'm anxious. We've got to get that out there. Mm -hmm. It's the seven mm. in a pure form. And yes, we know the minora is the Kabbalistic tree. What is the great bear? What is the great year cycle? What is the procession of the equinox? What are circumpolar constellations? What is an archetype? What is a sigil? What is a talisman? What is a deluge? What is the great deluge? What is the inundation? Yeah, I was talking about the inundation now. And one thing about, I wanted to say about the inundation was the annual flooding of the Nile banks with the fluvian soils, re, re, you know, enriching the barren land with fertility. That's actually where we get the idea of Kem, which means the black land, because in the inundation, the, the banks of the Nile were flooded to turn the arid land, the brown, dusty land, black, which means it's ready for a new fertile season of planting. Um, so the inundation was the annual flooding of the banks of the Nile, and that was actually measured by the rising of the star Sirius. So that was the point I was trying to make about the stellar people keeping track of their annual cycles by the inundation and also the rising of the star Sirius in the east and then the movement across the sky through into the west. There's a lot more to go into on that, but we're almost done here. So who was King Arthur? What is the Holy Grail? What century is King Arthur said to have lived? What is Hadrian's Wall? Who were the Celtic people? Or who were the Celts? Who were the Saxons? What year was the Norman invasion of England? What is the Renaissance? What is worldview schism? What is apophysis? What is the Hegelian dialectic? What is Rex Nemorensis? And who is Diana? Those are just some of the questions I pulled out off the top of my head that I feel that the answers to are the minimum requirement for the criteria 
and not only that has to become common knowledge which understood means understood by most people in the world before we're going to find a way to really get out of this predicament that we find ourselves in today so i want you to pay attention to the rhetoric and i want you to pay attention to the standards and understand that us for us as a species to reach our full potential we need to really take ourselves seriously and ultimately understand it has to go to scholarship i'm not discounting vitriol but ultimately we not only have to be mature in our understanding but we do need to be mature in our behavior as well couldn't agree more well that's a lot of really important questions to answer so Okay, guys, this show has been beyond amazing. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's all the time we have. So thanks, Douglas. Thank for... you for having me on the show. Been anxious to get on here. Yeah, man, we're definitely going to have more shows coming up with you. And uh, like I said, put a finer point on all these important topics. And you're, uh, you're definitely one of the greatest inspirations for... Uh, all of my work and and i'm very yeah. thankful for that so thanks again and uh, thank you to who's listening i hope you found value in the work that you've heard here today so if you want to go see more shows and look to see what more or what uh what other news is up on the website just go to cubbyhole.com that's c-u-b-b-y-w-h-o-l-e.com and if you want to find any more uh, information on Doug, you can just uh, go to cubbyhole.com and look under Douglas, and you will find uh, all his videos and information. And we hope to have you listen to the next show coming up. So thank you, and have a great day. Thanks for having me on, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at Seed 4. All right, so there you have it. Another epic episode that, again, just to let you know, just so you could listen to the original episode on your own time in case you are really a, an astute student of this kind of work because, I mean, even after listening to that entire episode for about, I think, the uh, at least at least the fourth time that's the fourth time I've heard that episode. I still want to go back and um, and get and listen to that episode again. There's just so much knowledge. He, um, man, Douglas Martin does his work is just absolutely phenomenal. I could talk about it all day. Um, yeah, like powerful, powerful stuff, dude. The, the, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to end. <laughs> <laughs> His work is so good, man. Uh, check out check out Douglas Martin's work. He is um I don't know if I mentioned it before, but he is, he is a he is one of the many content creators on the One Great Work Network, and that, that that's part of the reasons why part of the reason why he's an absolute legend. I mean, we just abs- highly revere his work. Uh I mean, just good stuff. I hope you guys learned a lot on this episode eight. And uh, next time you tune in, we will be on episode nine of the Cubbyhole podcast. I know it took three episodes to get through that one, but that's just the type of, uh, I mean, like Brandon Martin says about uh, Mark Passio, um, Douglas Martin, just like Mark Passio, comes out like a, a roaring emerald lion. He plays no games. He takes no prisoners. He, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you heard, you heard the, you heard, you heard, if you, if you're here this long, if you're still here, you've heard how extensive his work is. And, uh, yeah, so if you're into that work, definitely go check him out on One Great Work Network again. I don't care if I sound like a, a broken tape recorder. Uh, <laughs> it's worth it. His, his work is powerful, man. So, uh, uh, thanks again if you made it this far. Um, we're going to keep grinding. Um, unfortunately tomorrow, Friday, uh, Friday, February, whatever it is. Uh, I don't get to, I don't get to upload any episodes tomorrow because I have a show to play and I will be at the Michiana education and arts club 
um, all day tomorrow, probably 10 a.m. to freaking probably 9 p.m., even though my wife may or may not be there because we don't have a car. But, uh, yeah, so I'm going to be there putting in work. So pro next episode probably won't be uploaded till Saturday, till maybe Sunday, you know. And then, uh, so, fr yeah, so Friday, um, Michigan Education and Arts Club, we got a show coming up. It's going to be um, Jess Jones from Indianapolis and then uh, Patrick Warner from um, Denver, Indiana, our very own Denver, Indiana. And then uh, I myself, um, under the name of Dead and on Sarah, is going, I'm going to be opening up the show. I'm going to be playing um, some Johnny Cash songs. I'm going to be playing some, uh, I'm going to be playing a Charlie Parr song and a Justin Towns Earl song because those guys are absolute legends. If you don't know who they are, go look up Charlie Parr and go look up Justin Towns Earl if you're into country music, if you're into bluegrass music. Yep, the grind never ends here over here at Beagle Eye Vision. So, um, speaking of beagles, I probably have to go take them to go O U T, to go P O T T Y. If you catch my drift. All right. <laughs> I've ranted off enough. Um, thank you so much if you made it this far. Thank you. Seriously, thank you so much. We just broke over we just broke over 100 subscribers. So, shout out to you very loyal 100 subscribers. Thank you guys. I know there's a couple of Skatetopians in there who subscribe, so thank you. Thank you to those Skatetopians. And if you haven't been to Skatetopia, be sure to go out there this year because Seed 4, no, not Seed 4, uh, Seed 3 conference was actually live at Skatetopia. So, um, yeah, so check it out. Check it out. It's amazing property. Shout out to the Skate Pope. I hope the Skate Pope's doing well. And um, I just had, uh, we went to a funeral today. So, all right, rest in peace, um, Doug Netrauer. Rest in peace. Uh, you are the reason why I continue to do this work. You are one of the many reasons. Uncle Doug was an absolute fucking legend. Um, oops, I cussed. But sometimes it's necessary, necessary to cuss. So it's okay. Um, yeah, so stay tuned, man. Thank thank you guys who made it this far. Um, we'll keep up the good work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll keep putting it out if you keep listening. And even if nobody's listening, I'm probably still going to keep putting it out because that's what it's about, right? We got to study those morals, study those, study the natural law, study morals, be responsible. Don't, uh, I was about to say, don't be a smart individual because of 2 AJ kill, but you should, you know, always, always be a smart individual. Hollows over balls. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.